Welcome to the Reader Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where the independent new authors come first. One of the Lucky Ones is the new book. It just hits stores. It's written by A.E. Lee. And the author, Amanda, is joining me here right now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. And we get to talk all about it. Amanda, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's my pleasure. It's so exciting when you get a new book published. Yours is one of the lucky ones. So, Amanda, tell me all about it. What's this book about? Yeah, so this book is about my survival from a domestic violence situation a relationship that I was in with my ex-husband. And it really kind of stems from when I was going through it, I was trying to get all the information that I could. and I just desperately wanted to read a story that was similar to mine. And at the time, the only book that I could find was Tina Turner's. And while it, it was great, I'm, I'm not a multi-million dollar singer. <laughs> <laughs> and it really, it, it became something therapeutic for me to write. It's what I turned to when I felt like I couldn't go on. And I hope, my hope is that someone just like me, who unfortunately is in that circumstance, will pick it up and it'll provide them with some sort of comfort. Mm. Is that primarily the kind of audience you're writing to then, the people who have been dealing with domestic violence? Yeah, or people who know it. It's a lot more common than I realized. Mm. After everything happened, all of a sudden, I felt like everybody came out of the woodworks and was like, oh, that happened to me. Let me tell you my story. Oh, that happened to me. Let me tell you that story. And I was dumbfounded by the amount of women and men that I knew that had been in a domestic violence situation. So how long of a process was this for you from when you first sat down, started writing it, clear up until it was published? So I wrote it fairly quickly. I had been playing around with the idea of writing. Once I started to try and heal and go through therapy, someone had suggested that, you know, you can't find anything for you. Why don't you write something? Hmm. And as a newly single mother of two small children, I was like, yeah, sure. Like, I'll put that into my (laughs) schedule. And one night I couldn't sleep and I started thinking about like, okay, well, if I wrote a chapter, well, this is what I would title this chapter. Oh, and I could find a quote for this. And it just kind of came together. And I wrote the book fairly quickly. I think it was about a month. And then I showed it to one of my good friends who told me it was amazing. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. Like, (laughs) you're my friend. You're just saying that. And then it was suggested that I find a professional editor. And I did. And they were like, this is great. You've got to pursue publishing it. So I would say in total, it was about a two-year process. Mm. Was this your first venture then into this arena of writing and publishing books? It is. Yes. Oh, congratulations. What was it like after what was it like after that time of working on it that you finally got that first hard copy in? You got to hold this thing for the first time. Oh my gosh, so surreal. I got my <laughs> first hard copy the morning of my 48th birthday. Oh wow. And I was just like, what an amazing gift to start <laughs> my new decade. <laughs> You know, a lot of people listening are authors who are in that sort of spot. They're just starting out. So, Amanda, do you have any advice that you could offer them? Don't give up. It is a hard process. I think I sent my manuscript to like 150 literary agents at one point, Mm. as well as I'm going to butcher the quote, but it was something about editing. And it's like, once you think you're done editing, you're not. Someone else is going to rip it apart. And you've got to realize Mm. that everyone's just trying to better your work, not necessarily tear you down. Mm, Absolutely. Got to have some pretty thick skin to survive in this arena. Absolutely. (laughs) Amanda, have you given thought to writing more or publishing more in the future? Yeah, absolutely. I have two actually other books coming out. I wrote a children's story about a mother who's comforting her son, who there was just like an incident at their house. Because again, when I was going through everything with my children, I couldn't find something that was just generic that kind of provided comfort. So it's based on a saying that I said to my son over and over again, putting him to sleep and just trying to reassure him. And then my next book, my other book is a collection of poems. I did a challenge of 60 poems in 60 days last year. Oh, wow. And I was like, this is crap. Like, (laughs) no one's going to read this. And my publisher was like, no, no, no. 
send it to me. And then she's like, no, we're going to publish this. I'm like, are you insane? <laughs> but you know, I'm, it is an amazing book. Everyone should buy it. <laughs> Well, I know a lot of people are going to be helped and blessed by this book. It's titled One of the Lucky Ones. It's written by A.E. Lee. And it's published by Fulton Books. Of course, you can grab this one up anywhere, like on Amazon, at Barnes & Noble, on iTunes, Google Play, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Amanda, thank you again for joining me here and telling me about your story and about your work. I had such a nice time talking with you. Thank you so much. I did, too. Understanding God, the joy of finally hearing God's good and gracious word. That's the new book in stores right now, written by Tom Cleary. And Tom is joining me here right now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. And we get to talk all about it. Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you, Corey. I appreciate you letting me uh, come on. I appreciate you joining me. Can you tell me all about what readers can expect in Understanding God? Well, what this book is, it's an examination of some of the awful effects of thinking that you need to perform, quote unquote, works to get God to love you. And I use my life as a case study in that. And so it's really a journey from faith to disbelief and back to faith by finally understanding what God has been trying to communicate to us all along, that we simply need to believe in his son, Jesus. And with that, we can be assured of our salvation. Tom, what kinds of readers were you speaking to here? Well, you know, really those that are burned out by this notion that you have to to earn God's grace. Mm. People that are thinking, I can never be worthy enough, I can never meet that standard, or I think the people that are telling me this are hypocritical, and so they've ended up drifting away from the church. And so that's really the primary target market is the, the people that have mm. kind of given up thinking there's any hope in this Savior called Jesus Christ. Mm. And Tom, can you go back to that point whenever you decided, hey, I need to sit down and start writing this book and release it? Well, all during the 2021, I was kind of thinking I had a book inside of me. Hmm. And it really was a decision that I wanted to be able to communicate what I think is a, a clear understanding of God's true word. And I wanted to do that in a book form. And so I decided I'm going to sit down. And that was probably in October of 2021. And the next three months is when I just banged out the book, you know, a little bit every day. And then out it came. Is this your first time in the arena of writing or publishing? It is my first published book. For about five years, I have been publishing a blog. It's now about twice a week, uh, believeandobey.net, on the application of, of Christian principles to some of the current events and comments on scriptural readings and these kinds of things. So I've been doing that since 2017. So that's kind of where I got the writing bug going was from that. But this is, my, in fact, my first published formal book. Mm. Are there plans for publishing more maybe in the future? Well, yeah. I mean, if you're if you got the writing bug, you've always got something going. Mm. And so what I'm working on now is what I think will be a devotional with comments on the gospel readings as found in the three cycles of the common lectionary. So there would be, you know, each week would be a new gospel reading based on that week's reading in the common lectionary. Just some thoughts from my perspective. Mm. Tom, what's that moment like then whenever you finally get the first copy and the physical copy, you get to hold this thing you've been working on all that time? It's a little weird. It's, uh, wow, this, thing, this thing's real. And then, of course, the thought hits you right away. There's no more revisions. This is it. Mm. This is out there. And <laughs> for good or for ill, this is the way it's going to be. And, and that's okay. Although I, I think it was weirder when I saw it up online, uh, in mm. the e-version. I thought, I thought wow, that's, that's kind of strange. But, you know. <laughs> but in a, in, in a good, it was strange, it's strange in a good way. Well, publishing for the first time can be quite the learning experience, and you probably know that as well as anybody, Tom. So do you have any advice now to those listening who are about to embark on that same journey? Well, first of all, I would tell people, write what you know about. Mm. You know, it's just going to be a lot more authentic and a lot more real if you write, whether it's a, a fiction or a nonfiction, whatever, but write about the, the world that you've come from and you understand. Second thing I would tell people is just start. If you're waiting until you got enough time and resources to have a writer's cabin in the mountains, it will never happen. <laughs> Just sit down and, and start banging out some words. Mm. It may not be pretty at the beginning, and you may have to reformulate and rework it, but you just have to get started. So, you know, I sound like a Nike commercial, right? Just do it. <laughs> but that's what it is. And the other thing is, I don't know if this is a universal, but it, it works for me, is to, to write the way you talk. Mm. If it sounds right in your head, that's probably an authentic voice that you're hearing, and that's going to come out when you put it up on the page. And then be as emotionally honest as you can be. 
And especially with a faith-based book, I think that's really important because that lends authenticity to it as well. It's going to have a greater impact when you do that. Hmm. I know a lot of readers are going to be blessed by this book, and my listeners should check this out. It's titled, Understanding God, The Joy of Finally Hearing God's Good and Gracious Word. It's written by Tom Cleary, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. Of course, you can find it everywhere, like at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and down the street at your local bookshop. Well, Tom, thanks again for coming by the show and telling me all about understanding God. I had such a nice time chatting. Well, quite I sure appreciate being able to share this with your listeners, and thank you for your time. Author Marlena DeMarco Hogan just released the next book in her series of children's books, The Growing Up Years. This one's called Growing Up in the Pasta Zone. I'm really happy that Marlena is right here with me now and we get to talk all about it. Marlena, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you here. Can you tell me all about growing up in the pasta zone? Yes, thank you. It's one of these five storybooks that I've developed. This is the fourth, and it is dedicated to my two nephews and son and describes a family tradition of making pasta sauce once a year. And we used to do it in my parents' backyard for about 30 years, and it was a very exciting, anticipated event. Hard work, lots of fun the whole weekend, and it was the inspiration for this storybook pasta zone. Hmm. And what sorts of readers do you think would be most into the series? The series pinpoints activities of little ones, young children, and I see it as a book that would be read to one to five-year-olds and perhaps a a nice beginning book for early readers, five to eight years old. Hmm. The activities are outdoor fun at the beach, in the backyard, different things children do with family, with friends. Hmm. And when you get started on one of these books in this series, Marlena, about how long does it take you to write and then put through all those publishing processes? Well, the first one, Growing Up in the Dragonfly Zone, which is a love poem to my son. That's where it all began. Uh, And it didn't take very long to put together for me to put it down in words. And then I put together a few illustrations to go along, and I was lucky The year that I went searching for a publisher, Newman Springs just began actually in 2018, and uh, I submitted my work to them. And it took about, I believe, six or seven months for the whole process in which began with submission and acceptance and then all the different phases of the process, including the illustrations, which their artists did a wonderful job in putting my little stick figures to life. (laughs) Marlena, what's it like when you finally do get one of your books in, the physical copy in for the first time, and you get to look at it and hold it for the first time? It must be a special moment for you. I feel as though, just like the in the storybook Pinocchio, my little stick figures did come to life. <laughs> they were not animated as they became so with, with the publication. So I, I really saw a beautiful end, an end goal uh, develop. Hmm. And I understand that the next book, the final book in this series, will be coming up soon. So do you have plans to write beyond that? These storybooks came to me one at a time. The second being Growing Up in the Splash Zone, story about my childhood. The third, Growing Up in the Medieval Time Zone, story my mother told about when she was back in her small town in Italy, Mm. working on this project with her father and brother with a little donkey she used to bring up sand to the castle they were mending. And this final book, Growing Up in the Turon Zone, came to me also easily reminiscing the, the stories told at the family table at holidays, my father's story, while he was a young boy making Torone, an Italian holiday candy, Mm. and the process that went into it. So these stories, this series is done. I know that my mind has no more stories (laughs) in the growing up years to present as far as I could tell. But I have been writing since I was young poetry, Mm. and I do have a few more children's stories, one already developed, another coming to me. I think I will continue writing, hopefully. Well, I really think that children and families will really enjoy this book, this whole series. This one's called Growing Up in the Pasta Zone. It's written by Marlena DeMarco Hogan. 
and it's published by Newman Springs Publishing. Of course, you can find it everywhere, like at Amazon or at Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and also at traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Marlena, it's been wonderful talking with you tonight. Thank you so much for joining me on the show and telling me all about this work. I hope we can get together again sometime soon. Thank you so much. I do appreciate it. And yes, they are available in local stores. And that has been one of my other pleasures is connecting with local community people and store owners and having that experience with them. Thank you. Sitting down right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable is author Harry Swanson. Harry, thanks for being here with me tonight. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. It's my pleasure. You have a new book out. This is fantastic. The title is Thomas Jefferson's Wee Little Book, Purified by Fire. Harry, can you tell me about this? Yes, it's a uh, revision and improvement on a work that Thomas Jefferson had completed back in 1820. It was a morals project where he was looking to basically improve his own life and walk. And what he did is he searched out to find the best moral teachings he could find. And he found them in the scriptures, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what he did is he went through and cut out all the teachings of Jesus. He then put them in time order and by topic. So he cut out about a total of 1,100 verses, put them in 81 categories, then put them in time order, then taped them into blank pages in order. And he used that as his own personal uh, nightly study. He referred to it as his uh, wee little book, which is where I got the title from. And it was never published. It's not well known. And what I did is I went in and improved it in terms of I changed the version from the King James Version, which is a little tough for people to read today. Mm. And I put it into New International Version. Then I went in and added a commentary on every section just to give the reader more of an understanding of the scripture verses and the teaching itself. And I drew from the Matthew Henry commentaries to do that which were popular in the de- in the time of Thomas Jefferson. It's a fantastic so, commentary. Correct. So that's it in a nutshell. It, it's a revision to the original, and it's much more suited for today, for today's reader. Hmm. Well, Harry, how did you get the idea to take this kind of a project on? I stumbled into it quite a number of years ago. I didn't know that his book, even it were his nightly study, existed. And I found it would be so much better today if it was revised and brought back. And I was kind of surprised that no one else had ever done that. Mm. On occasion, you'll see it referenced by authors, but no one's ever actually gone into the work itself and uh, redone it and brought it back. It's just, it's the greatest collection of moral teaching. It's designed by Jefferson to be rapid fire, meaning you can go through it and do quite a bit of headway each night as going through it, and then redo it again when you finish, start all over, which is what he did. He did it every night. Mm. How long of a process was this for you, Harry, once you started up until the time that it hit stores? Well, I did the bulk of it this year, but believe it or not, I started it back in around 1978, and I was almost doing what Jefferson did. This predates computers, so I was Xeroxing the pages of all the scriptures, putting them in order, and then writing the commentaries underneath it, and then just got lost. Uh, You know, life comes about, and uh, I put it aside up until earlier this year and went back to it and, you know, really worked on it pretty hard, putting in long hours and I'm kind of happy the way it turned out. It's what I wanted back 40 years ago, clear and concise, and just sticking with what Jefferson wanted. He wanted something that was rapid fire, easy to read, no nonsense, and then you get it and move on to the next lesson. What was it like when the day came, you got the first hard copy in of this book, you got to hold it, Harry, what was that like? Yeah, that was pretty exciting uh, after all these years, and it, it takes a long time to put these things together and get it laid out properly and get all approvals and copyright and whatnot. So it's a lot of fun because you know the reader will benefit from it. It's, mm. it's not like a fictional book. You'll actually come along a long way as we are studying these scriptures. Mm. Well, I think a lot of people are really going to benefit from this book, Harry, and my listeners should check it out. The title is Thomas Jefferson's Wee Little Book, Purified by Fire. 
It's written by Harry Swanson and is published by Christian Faith Publishing. You can get it everywhere, like at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores, too. Harry, thank you again for joining me here tonight and telling me all about your work. I had a really nice time talking. Yeah, I appreciate your time, and thank you very much. Joining me now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable is author Constance Glickman. Connie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me here tonight. Well, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Oh, so am I. I'm looking forward to finding out all about your new book. It's in stores now, and it's called Darby the Polka Dot Dinosaur. So, Connie, can you tell me all about this book? Yes, I'd love to. This story brings to children an imaginary friend, Darby. Darby the Polka Dot Dinosaur. Darby, who can turn the color of love, catch vanilla cookie fish from the sky, and sing catchy songs and children laugh at the song is the answer to a birthday wish made to the mythical pink horse. Together, Darby and his buddy welcome playmates to share the fun of hide and seek, singing and dancing to the, and here's what children love and laugh, hacha, hacha, ha, ha, ha and catching snowflakes on their tongues. Darby has a very long tongue. Darby and his buddy share the same birthday. His buddy will be five, and he will be one million. They have a party. And Darby never had a birthday party before. This is his first one. He's very touched. And they have birthday cupcakes, and they blow out the candles. The pink horse returns to grant their birthday wishes. She comes back and grants the birthday wishes of Darby and his buddy. And that is she grants them another gift of sharing another year together. At the end of the book is a separate page where readers can write or make their own birthday or their own wishes. And that's unique. And the pink horse, I hope, will grant the wishes of the readers and give them that gift of a happy and wonderful birthday. Mm. There was a lot of praise for Darby, the polka dot dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to read one of them to you. I will stumble a little bit because I have it under a magnifier, so go with me. This enchanting, delightful story of Darby, the polka dot dinosaur, taps into children's keen sense of make-believe and will appeal to young children very much. Connie, how did you get the idea or the inspiration for Darby, the polka dot dinosaur? Well, I know children love dinosaurs, and I have a magic pocket. I have children and grandchildren, and at one time I taught. I have a New York State and New York City teaching licenses, and I taught, and I know what children like, and they can pull it out of my magic pocket, and then my imagination takes over. That's what I wanted to discuss with you, the fact that children love fantasy, and the book is a fantasy book. The illustrations make that fantasy real. And I tried in the illustrations to capture the body language and the expressions of young children so they can relate to the fantasy and it becomes real for them. And I think I accomplished that because the praise that I've gotten for the book appears to augment that and say, yes, yes, that does happen. And I watch the faces of, of adults as they read it, and I see that they get absorbed as well. So I, I, I feel very gratified that that happens, and I wanted to bring that out for anybody who's a new writer or somebody who is writing a children's book. That is important to have the reality through illustrations as well as through words. Mm. I think a lot of people are going to enjoy this book. Again, it's titled Darby the Polka Dot Dinosaur. It's written by Constance Glickman and is published by Newman Springs Publishing. Of course, you can find it everywhere, like on Amazon and Barnes & Noble, on iTunes, and at traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Connie, thank you again for joining me tonight and telling me all about your book. I had a really nice time talking with you. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it as well. And thank you so much. 
When God Came My Way. It's the new book. It's out in stores right now, written by Dave Zimmerman. And Dave, sitting right here with me now, we're going to chat all about it. Dave, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable, and thank you so much for joining me. Hey, my privilege. Glad to do it. Well, I'm glad to have you here, Dave. Can you tell me what readers can expect with When God Came My Way? What can they expect? <laughs> you know, that's a good question. I don't know. I spent a long time putting this together over a period of a couple of years. I don't know. For me, it was just, uh, I just felt I had to write it, get it down. And for me, it was an accomplishment of, of looking back on it and saying, uh, I can't believe all those things really happened, but it did. And I thought, well, maybe somebody else can read it and say, I've experienced something similar to that. And maybe it would bring them closer to God in some way. I guess that would be one of the things that I hope would come from it. Dave, was the writing of this book something that took you a long time? Yes, it did. I, I must have gone to this thing and then gone back and back and forth. Yeah, a couple of years, probably, back and forth. Have you ever done anything like this before when it comes to writing a book or publishing? I've written uh, over 30 books, hmm. so it wasn't a, a, a new experience from that standpoint, but certainly new in terms of what happened to me. Well, Dave, you're a veteran author. To you, what's the most rewarding aspect of knowing that your work is out there for the world? You know, that's an interesting question. I have a lot of my books have been given to people and the selling was quite profitable, but the reaction I get from folks is quite interesting. Mm. Like this book, several people have read it and I would expect, geez, I, that's an experience. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> but that hasn't happened. You know, it's, it's one of those things where you wonder, did you read it? Did you get anything out of it? Did it mean anything to you? But I think the point is I got something out of it. Have you thought about what's next? Do you plan on writing more, publishing more? Yes, I've got two more books that are in the publishing stage right now. I've written a lot of books on the Green Bay Packers, so that's one of them that's out there to be published. That's what I do in my hobby now that I've been retired for some years. Yes, writing is about, that's what I do. Mm. <laughs> that's about all I do in these days. Mm. Dave, does the moment ever get old? Does that feeling ever get old whenever you finally get that first physical copy of the book that you've been working on in and you get to hold that thing for the first time? What's that like? No, it never, it never gets old. And when people make some comments on it, you know, when the book sales are good, that's a good feeling. But I think just the fact that you look at it, you've written something that's going to last forever. And that's quite a feeling that's a good feeling. But the bottom line is it's a real good feeling to be able to have done it and see some success. Hmm. Well, Dave, drawing from all your experience writing and publishing here over the years, what's your best advice for those listening right now who are the aspiring authors and they're just about to embark on this journey of writing and publishing? A lot of people have asked me that question. I've helped a few people write their own biographies and background. I would say to those thinking about it, just do it. There's always someone can clean it up for you. I mean, you just write it the way you feel it should be said and then find somebody to help you clean it up, brush it off a bit, and uh, maybe correct some of the things that maybe need correcting. But I would just say jump in and do it. Mm, good advice. Now, you're quite prolific when it comes to writing, Dave. Do you ever get writer's block? Do you ever deal with those times when the ideas just aren't coming? <laughs> oh, yes. In fact, I'm, I'm in one right now where it's three quarters done and it just sticks there and I can't quite figure out what the... It's a novel I'm working on it and it's kind of stuck on me. But yeah, I, I would say you get writer's block from time to time. Not as much as maybe some folks do. Mm. What's your strategy for maybe getting those ideas going again? It's all around you. My goodness. There's so many things around you that you can pick up on and write about. I always felt that I would write something that was of interest to me. And as it turned out, you hope that maybe if somebody reads it, it's of interest to them as well. One of the books I wrote about was a hero of mine growing up as a Green Bay Packer. And the fact that I got a chance to spend time with him and write about him, talk to him, his family, his kids, was a real treat. One of those things that you don't get an opportunity to. And that would be the only time that me would be able to sit down and talk to somebody of that caliber. Hmm. Well, I think this book is really going to reach and help a lot of readers. It's titled, When God Came My Way. It's written by Dave Zimmerman, and it's published by Covenant Books. You can find this book everywhere, of course, like at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Dave, thank you again for joining me here at the show tonight and telling me about this book. I had a really nice time chatting with you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. This book is a thrilling sci-fi ride, and more. It's called Crystal Child, the Diamond Star Saga. The author is Carol Kaufman, and I'm really happy that Carol is joining me right now here on the show, and we get to chat all about it. 
Carol, welcome. Thank you for being here tonight. Well, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk about this. Well, I'm excited, too. This book sounds really exciting. Can you tell me all about Crystal Child? Well, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty long saga, but it is very exciting. It, as you said, is a sci-fi, and I would call it a sci-fi plus thriller. And it centers on a, a young girl from Minnesota whose rather ordinary life is suddenly totally shattered when she finds herself in a world that's so strange and so bizarre that she is certain she's got to be dreaming. But slowly, she learns the truth. She's been teleported to a star by a group of brilliant scientists. And on that star, they have found a prophecy claiming that Crystal alone needs to be responsible for saving humanity from a complete annihilation. She knows this is a colossal mistake. She's only 13, for one thing. And the other thing, she's got an attention deficit disorder. Hmm. And as most kids with ADD, the harder she tries to think, the more her brain freezes. She just is thinking this has to be a cosmic joke. But as she tries to find answers, her adventures kind of take her from Earth to the Diamond Star to Cancri E, which is a planet about 40 light years away from Earth. And it's a real planet, actually. You can Google that. And this is where the robotic, terrifying thugs live. So that's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to give away the plot, but just say this is a complex saga, which ultimately shows the power of compassion and teamwork and pure grit to overcome all obstacles. And with Crystal, it shows her you don't have to have superpowers to save the Earth sometimes. Just being who you are is enough. That's it in a nutshell. I love it. Wow, it sounds like quite a ride. Carol, where'd you get the idea for this? As with a lot of ideas, it just came very serendipitously. I was, and I don't even remember what I was Googling way back. I think it was about 2015. But you know how you go to a link and that leads to another link and another no. link and <laughs> something popped up and they said, scientists have discovered a star that is about 50 light years from Earth and it is down to a white dwarf, as they call them which is basically a giant cinder of carbon. And we know that carbon is diamond. So they theorize that basically what you have in the sky is a gigantic diamond. In fact, they called it Lucy. Huh. And this is actually true. It's something you can look up. And I thought to myself, ooh, that'd make a good children's story, <laughs> a kid's book. I think I'm going to start writing something. And that's the only goal I had in mind when I started writing it. And then somehow the settings and the characters just took on a life of their own. I've heard other authors say that. And I, I think to myself, what do they mean? But now I know. <laughs> they just came to me and that's how it started. Was Crystal Child intended for younger readers then, would you say? Yeah, it was strange at first because Crystal is almost 13 and, and her birthday's in five days. And that's the big day that the world is either supposed to be saved or annihilated. And so something is going on with her birthday. When I first started out, I started reading all the rules for children's literature. And I found out, oh, my goodness, if, if the protagonist is only 13, then your readers have to be nine. And other things, how many pages? It can only be 200 pages. And I went to my consultant who taught fiction writing at The Ohio State University. And she said, Carol, just write your story. So I did. And it ended up breaking some rules. So I would say that generally it would be for upper middle grades, mm. but depending on the child and his or her interests. What I envision is parents and children reading this book together mm. because there are a lot of issues that children are going through in this day and age. And it would be great to have an adult discuss these things with them. Mm. I know a lot of readers are really going to love this book and ought to check it out. The title is Crystal Child, The Diamond Star Saga. This is written by Carol Kaufman, and it's published by Fulton Books. You can grab this one anywhere, like at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, Google Play, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Carol, thank you again for coming on the show and chatting with me about your work. I had a really nice time tonight. Okay, I, I really enjoyed it, too. Thank you so much. This book is a personal memoir about the ride of a lifetime. It's called 15 Minutes with Fame, 50 Years Among the Stars. 
It's written by Anthony Salerno Jr., and Tony, the author, is right here with me, and we get to talk all about it. Tony, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Corey. Well, it's my pleasure. Tony, can you tell me all about this book? It sounds really interesting. Fifteen Minutes with Fame. Well, you know, Andy Warhol once famously said that everybody's going to get their 15 minutes of fame. Well, in my career, which spanned 50 years in the entertainment business, I discovered that I was getting the opportunity to spend 15 minutes with hundreds, if not thousands, of celebrities, stars, political figures, etc. And over the course of that year, I uh, discovered that I was learning about those people, what they were like backstage, and I remembered those memories. And so I decided I put it all down. Hmm. How long did this whole thing take you, Tony? Well... It sort of happened in a cathartic kind of way. Uh, I was retiring from the business, had more time on my hands, found that as I got older, those memories lived more vividly because I guess I had more time to think about them. So I just started jotting them down. I did it in a chronological kind of order, beginning with my early uh, days, beginning in the business. And it just sort of took off from there. When I had a moment or when the notion struck me, I'd sit at the computer. Sometimes I recorded my thoughts and then transcribed them, and it just came together in that way. Hmm. Now, I understand this is your first book, Tony. Yeah, it is. Congratulations. What was the most challenging part about the whole thing? Well, you know, I never took any contemporaneous notes, and so this truly is a memoir in the sense that it's just my memories. So I wanted to make sure that I didn't make things up. Hmm. Things actually happened the way I remembered them. So there would be lots of calls to former colleagues and friends and people that I went through some of those experiences with. And while that was a challenge, it was also a great opportunity to reconnect with people that I hadn't spoken to in years Mm. and to just relive those moments. Must have been quite a day then when it finally came, that first physical copy of 15 Minutes with Fame, Tony. What was that moment like? It was very exciting. You know, the box that you see on TV and movies all the time arrived. Mm. And we cracked it open, and there they were. The cover, the way I had designed it with the designer at the publishing company, and then to actually be able to leaf through it and see the words there in book format. It was a lot of fun. Mm. It was pretty cool. What are the chances you'll think you'll be doing more writing, maybe more publishing up ahead of us? Well, there are a couple of things rattling around in my mind, and I never envisioned myself an author in the sense of writing a book. Mm. Through my career, I would do continuity writing. I would certainly review lots of scripts and work with writers in that regard, both in the entertainment business and, and even for a short while in the political side of it. But I never envisioned myself being someone who would sit down and, and write a book, let alone two books. I do have a couple of thoughts. And sometimes I think it's more for the family and more for a uh, legacy kind of thing than wanting to get it out to the whole world. But we'll see what develops. And I'm sure you learned a lot along the way of doing this, Tony. Do you have any words of wisdom for the authors out there who are just starting out? I don't know how much wisdom there'll be in my words, but (laughs) just go ahead and do it and just keep writing. Don't try and make it perfect the first time. Mm. Just sit down and write. And keep writing. And whatever thoughts come to you, write them. Worry about the form. Worry about the grammar and the syntax and all of those kinds of things at a later date. Get your thoughts down. And then when it seems like, geez, I can't do this anymore, keep doing it. And eventually you end up with a couple of hundred or 300 pages. Mm. Is that how you would get through those tough times, Tony? Maybe where you were having a hard time coming up with the words or the ideas about what to write next? Would you just sit there and push through it? Yeah, I think I did. Mm. And again, some people who've read it that know me well said it's written the way I speak, for better or for worse. Mm. They could hear my voice in it. They could hear me talking, as it were. So I just kept trying to do it as if I was having a conversation with somebody, as if I was telling the story and not worrying about all of the fine points of it. I think a lot of people are really going to love this fascinating book. Again, it's titled 15 Minutes with Fame, 50 Years Among the Stars. This is written by Anthony Salerno Jr., and it's published by Fulton Books. Of course, you can grab it up anywhere like on Amazon or Barnes & Noble, iTunes, Google Play, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Tony, I appreciate you joining me on the show tonight and telling me about all these fascinating stories. I had a nice time chatting with you. 
Well, my pleasure, Corey. Thanks so much for uh, giving me the opportunity and hope you enjoy the book. Whispers of the Heart, A Child's Destiny. That's the new book. It just hit stores now. It's co-authored by Eileen Travis and Ella Linden. I'm really happy that both authors are right here with me now, and we get to chat all about this book. Eileen, Ella, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having us. We're excited. Yes, thank you. The pleasure's all mine. Can you tell me what readers are in store for with Whispers of the Heart? Well, let's say it's going to be just a sweet, charming story between some princesses and their adventures with choice and accountability. So it takes you through just a little bit of a life lesson, and Whispers of the Heart is just a magical story that will inspire one's choices as they experience life and move through this journey, hopefully, and help them to realize the beauty of making good choices. Yes, you will follow a child's journey through the whimsical realm of choice and accountability. The reader will be able to follow each outcome of the princess as they live and learn through their personal discovery. Hmm. What sorts of readers did you have in mind when you were writing this? Children. We love those babies. We're both (laughs) mothers of four. Mm -hmm. And I have 15 grandchildren. Wow. And the time that we spent with them and what we see happening in the world as far as just understanding accountability and the importance of being the ownership of good or bad Hmm. and being able to be strong and face that. And so we wanted our children and our family and grandchildren to be able to be those type of humans, to be an asset. So we focused on the young ones that could learn in a sweet, whimsical, magical world of princesses and castles and all of the good (laughs) sweet stuff, but learn a hard lesson at the same time. It's a great message. Well, I'm curious, how did the idea for this book come about? I woke up one morning and the idea came into my mind. And then I called Ella because for the 10 years that I have known her, people would come up to her and say, when are you going to write your book? (laughs) And I guess that they could see this ability in her and I saw it right off. So I called her that morning and I said, hey, this is the idea I have. How would you like to write this book with me? Was it something that took a long time to do, being co-authors? Well, we got together once a week because we don't live next to each other. And it took us a year to write it. And then it took us another year and a half to have it illustrated. When it comes to writing or publishing, what sorts of backgrounds do you guys have? None. Zero. (laughs) (laughs) This was... This is uh, our first rodeo. Yes. Just a whim and we did it and here we are. Hmm. I'm sure you learned an awful lot along the way of doing that. What advice would each of you have for the aspiring authors who are listening right now? Do it. Go for it. Just do it. Don't listen to anybody. If you have that spirit inside of you saying, right, put your pen to paper and go for it. Conquer your fears. Amen. Just do it. Great advice. And there's nothing like seeing that final product, the thing you've been working so hard on. So when the first physical copy of Whispers of the Heart came in, what was that moment like for you? Oh, my gosh. First of all, there was screaming and shouting and jumping and dancing. (laughs) Now, that's older women doing that. So picture that. (laughs) (laughs) Not as graceful as a few decades ago. Yes. but (laughs) And then there came tears of gratitude and joy. Mm Mm-hmm. We laughed till we cried, and we cried till we laughed. (laughs) Yes. It was just magical. We have a cute little saying that we say, we were pregnant for two and a half years, and the baby is beautiful. Our book is our baby. Mm. What are the chances then you might give birth again in the future? You might write another one after this. Oh, you're picking to find out secrets, but Mm. we'll tell you one. (laughs) There's a couple of on the back burner. Yes. Fantastic. I know a lot of readers are really going to love this book and should definitely check it out. It's called Whispers of the Heart, A Child's Destiny. It's written by Eileen Travis and Ella Linden, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. Of course, you can grab it up anywhere, like at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Eileen, Ella, thank you again for joining me here tonight and telling me all about Whispers of the Heart. I had such a nice time talking with you. Thank you for having us, and may we all find the whispers of our hearts. Joining me now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable is author Michael Meyer. Michael, thanks for being here. Welcome to the show. 
Thanks. I appreciate the offer. Well, the pleasure's all mine. There's a new book you have out in stores right now. It's called The Odyssey of Winnie, Our Two-Year Adventure Owning an RV. So, Mike, can you tell me what this is all about? Yeah, so a few years ago, we decided to uh, buy an RV. And you really have to understand that I am the least likely person on the planet to actually camp or own an RV. (laughs) And we sort of walked through the process of how I came to realize we needed to have an RV for a big trip that we were going to take across the country. And so this sort of, what it turned out is not only am I bad at camping, but apparently I'm bad at driving too. (laughs) And so there was just a whole slew of disasters that happened from the very first second we picked up the RV until we finally sold it. Having told these stories to lots of people, someone said, hey, you should write that down. I'm like, all right. (laughs) And so I just sort of worked through the process of our two years of owning the RV, most of which was me making a fool of myself and (laughs) not being able to blame anybody else, but apparently my bad driving skills. (laughs) Now, this book covers a two-year odyssey, like you said. So did it take you that long to write it, or was it a longer, shorter process when it came to writing this? Actually, writing it probably went pretty quickly because so much of it were stories that I've told before. And so for me, I got to relive so many of these really fun, funny experiences. I'm I'm lucky I have a beautiful, wonderful, awesome wife who's incredibly patient and has a great sense of humor. And so whereas most wives might have yelled and screamed, we just (laughs) laughed at my own stupidity. Yeah, as I was sort of writing it, as I sort of was telling a story and writing it up, I would then when we'd have dinner with the whole family, I would then ask them, Is this what you remember? Because this is what I remember. And, you know, the kids would, would sort of relive the experience and my wife would kind of relive her experience and the emotions that we were feeling and, and we all got to kind of relive our two years with Winnie kind of all over again. So for me it was it was just a delight to write because it, it we just had some great conversations at, at dinner, sort of talking about all these things that we had done. Mm-hmm. I could only imagine what it was like there whenever you got your first copy in and you got to actually hold your book for that first time. What was that like, Mike? You know, it was great. I I guess I just, it would be better if other people were sort of interested in really laughing and experiencing this with me. Mm. It's not just sort of a story of our time, but I try to provide a slew of helpful hints. So if you're interested in, in owning an RV, don't make the same mistakes I did. <laughs> and so I, everything that I wish I would have known that I learned after the fact sort of gets built into this. So it's like, you know, when you buy an RV, they just hand you the keys. My test drive was about three miles going straight 45 miles an hour. So I made the fatal mistake of telling my wife because she remembers these statements. I'm like, yeah, this is like driving a minivan. (laughs) <laughs> because going 45 miles an hour straight without turning is pretty much like a minivan. Mm. But unfortunately, when you actually have to drive it, you make turns. <laughs> you, know, you have to go through toll booths and things like that, where you know the first time going down the toll road, we were on the toll road for maybe 30 seconds. And you know, we didn't know to batten down the hatches. So the first thing, the coffee pot goes flying across the floor and <laughs> smashes to a thousand pieces. We've literally been driving maybe 100 yards onto the toll road, and this is how it starts. <laughs> You know, when you buy one of these crazy things, because it was 35 feet long, and when you pick it up, you know, we had like an hour and a half orientation of all of the different components, whether the electrical system and the plumbing system, and they had all five of our family members there, because they're like, well, no one's going to remember everything, but somebody might remember something, and so that's five set of ears. And so they're going all through this. You know, if we're going to spend 20 minutes talking about putting the awning down and putting it back up, could we not carve out five minutes to say, hey, this is how you turn it. Because when you turn sharp, the back end of the RV swings 12 feet wide and will take out anything and anyone in that distance. Had I known that little piece of information, that could have saved me thousands of money in repairs. I really think a lot of readers are going to love this book. It's called The Odyssey of Winnie, Our Two-Year Adventure Owning an RV. This is written by Michael Meyer, and it's published by Fulton Books. You can find this one everywhere, of course, like Amazon and Barnes & Noble and iTunes and Google Play and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Mike, thank you again for joining me here on the show and telling me all about the Odyssey of Winnie. I hope we get to talk again sometime soon. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. And uh, hey, buy the book. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, 
and triumphs of publishing their books. We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.